Thank you so much to the organizers uh, for including me in the event. So if I think back, uh, the, the first encounters with open source were, of course, through my CSIS advisor, uh, Eric von Hippel, uh, who uh, uh, latched on to open source as an important phenomenon very, very early on, uh, which was maybe not surprising coming from MIT and having in the many precursors to what happened 30 years ago, which is uh, Ines Torvalds uh, calling out uh, to others uh, to help him in an important project, as he said. Um, I think we have come a long way uh, from uh, from then. I recall that when I started my professorship in Munich, uh, I was involved in a book project on source. This was about the time when Munich switched to open source software. They switched back, they switched back again. Uh, and I think that the, the road uh, to open source software utilization and also to the proliferation or the greater use of open source hardware has been an arduous one, but we're making progress here. I think that's very good. Um, uh, if I look at the results of the study that we're looking at today, um, I think we now also have a sound foundation to claim what the welfare gains are uh, that we're looking at. Now, what I talk about is <clears throat> welfare gains from openness uh, in, in general. Uh, and by openness, uh, there are two essentially two terms out there, or the two uses of the term open innovation. One is coined by um, um, Henry Chesbro, and what he means really is bring an integrated innovation chain that was done within the corporates into something that is more collaborative. For that, we need at the transition points, IP, contracts, and all of the things, markets for technology. This is not what I mean. What I mean is really openness in the sense of relatively or completely free access software to hardware to data. So uh, please allow me to um, speak to that. Uh, and uh, the, the the key pitch that um, I'm trying to bring over, it, we're currently seeing a transition from uh, industrial innovation, which has strongly Im influenced uh, our policy making and many other things, to uh, digital innovation, which is working by rules. And that means that we will have to adjust innovation policies as well. What do I mean by that? Uh, essentially, what I mean is that uh, the, um, let's see whether I can get this to, to full beauty here. I have to, ta -da, ta -da. okay, it worked. So um, what I mean by that, by that transition from industrial innovation to digital innovation is captured in this paper that Sivan was alluding to already, uh, which we finished also about September. Um, and uh, I think Knut Blind uh, stumbled over it and saw it and uh, then um, sort of suggested to the organizers that it might be good if I talk a little bit about this. So this is by Jason Potts, an Australian economist, Andrew Torrance, a legal scholar, uh, I'm the sort of uh, add-on and Eric von Hippel uh, innovation scholar. And many of these folks in the list of authors have already pointed out that, you know, industrial innovation is not foreign to openness. Even in the 19th century, we have in some communities and some ecosystems forms of organization that mimic very much the innovation sharing, uh, the free revealing uh, regimes uh, that we also find in the 20th century. But the role of openness gets significantly larger in digital innovation because we now have information that can be shared easily, that can be searched easily. So getting to the information is very easy in these worlds, at least comparatively speaking. And moreover, it is information itself that becomes the, uh, the innovation of, um, uh, of interest. And that has profound, profound implications for uh, what we want, uh, what we want to do in innovation policy. So let me first turn to this innovation comments uh, term that some of you might find bewildering. The economists among you know that a Nobel Prize was given out uh, to Eleanor Ostrom for her work on comments, meaning on communally um, sort of managed property prices avoid uh, various shortcomings that we have in the presence of externalities. So what we do here is we define innovation commons as repositories of freely accessible open source, quote unquote, and more about 
innovation related information. We put open source in quote because we don't want to hijack the term here. Uh, I know that some of you feel very passionately about the term. So uh, please uh, take that as a sign of respect. And what we have in mind really is uh, that data and information is now an important prerequisite and um, um, input to the innovation process. So it's a significant resource for anybody who's innovating or adopting innovations and be that firms, be that individuals, be that households, whatever. So we think that the basic welfare enhancing factor associated with innovation commons is that they reduce the specific private or public investment required uh, from innovators when they make the, the next advance. So the secret here really is the freely accessible, the reduction of access codes, no market for technology, no licensing transactions, or uh, low touch, light touch licensing transactions, whatever. So freely accessible here means that if I'm interested in using particular data, I can gain access easily and work with the data. So trying to make innovation as, as easy as possible. Now, there are many types of commons, okay? So for example, the physical resource commons that Eleanor Ostrom has described really turn about goods that are rival in nature. Now, the information commons that we are talking about have something, information, data, that is not necessarily rival and in many cases clearly non-rival. We also find uh, very interesting um, similarities to um, what uh, archaeologists or um, also historians call midden heap commons. This is sort of the midden heap in, uh, in the archaeological perspective is sort of the collection of everything that a village throws away, okay? lot of innovation uh, away. Think Bellingcat uh, using pictures that were made by bystanders, by families, in order to piece together the history or the narrative uh, that describes how a uh, civilian airliner was shot down over Ukraine. Now, there are also government-provided comments. Uh, and one example that we discuss in the paper is PubCam. PubCam has been the the focus of a lot of attention. It was attacked uh, strongly by, by private information offerers, uh, but the president has maintained it and that it has a very, very important role in facilitating information and in providing access at very, very low cost. And then there are, of course, also hybrid commons, and uh, you may not want to believe this, but the patent system is a hybrid common because after the exclusion periods are out, Anything you can see in there that has passed, gone to the 20-year boundary or threshold of statutory term is, of course, usable. And you are, of course, informed about what is in there very, very early on. Now, with that come for many open sources, the nasty exclusion, right, that's uh, with, uh, with a patent. But the disclosure part of it makes it, in our view, a hybrid common. What are the gains? from free access to innovation commons. I gave you this uh, sort of oblique sentence already that said um, enabling. Innovation commons reduce innovation specific private and public investment. And that allows us to enable people to innovate that classically we have not had in our visor, that the policy makers have in visors. If you look at the classical innovation policy tools, like R&D tax credits, uh, subsidies for corporations, uh, uh, incentives for uh, for patenting, um, and so forth. Then this all focus on what Eric Van Ippel calls the manufacturer, the maker of things. And we do that because we think that this economic entity has scale advantages, scope advantages, and so forth. So the production of innovation can be, of course, incentivized at that particular locus. But there's an alternative view, especially in the data world, that there is a local owner of an innovation problem. And following Hayek, uh, that information and uh, innovation opportunities are local in nature. So that the big data hedging, data owning, data monopolizing enterprise, uh, I'm of course talking about completely fictitious enterprises, they don't really exist in reality, that those do not have the information about all local needs, all info innovation opportunities. And by releasing data, we enable local innovators. Now, 
we know that this works. Why do we know that this works? Well, crowdsourcing is by now an old hat, right? Crowdsourcing of knowledge allows us to really bring in knowledge from very, very diverse disparate sources. Uh, we have this term broadcast search in innovation economics, which essentially says that I'm not just working alone on my problem, but I could my, can put myself on a mountain, use the megaphone, and announce to the world that this is the problem I have. Please help me. Please help me for money. Please help me for good. Whatever. Okay. And of course, we're using innovation contests by now where we let very different parties compete in contests for a prize because we initially do not know who brings out the best innovation. So all of these contexts point to something that we call the advantage of innovation commons in freely allowing people to tap into data to innovate. So in order to make that happen, what should we do? Okay. The key thesis of our paper is this that the industrial innovation model is no longer appropriate as the sole guidepost for policymaking. And I think in that spirit and in that statement, we're very, very close to what uh, the authors uh, of the study that we're discussing today uh, have in mind and what the open source community has in mind. Now, we focus on data-driven innovation. And we think there we urgently need new concepts and policies. For example, that concept of innovation commons, which in our view is something like a substitute for markets for technology. Markets for technology mean what I had told you before, transactions cost. They mean to uh, sort of manage somehow the uncertainty that comes with innovation, that comes with new technology and new uses of technology in some contractual way, in some auction framework, which automatically leads to an increase in the price for access. So data is no longer freely available. So frictionless access to data for innovators is very important. And policies that favor that, we think, will create welfare gains. Now, government can also invest on its own and support open data. And again, this is something that we know. This is not something new that we pulled out of the hat. We know that open data policies can uh, create tremendous gains uh, for communities and favor innovation. But we still haven't made the leap in our public administrations, for example, certainly not in this country, in Germany, to release data that could possibly be, um, be relevant. And of course, this is a trade-off with privacy issues and so forth. I'm not talking about that. All I'm saying is not in the least against privacy protection and so forth. But the openness of data okay, can be granted once privacy has been taken care of to a much greater extent than we have been doing it in the past. So altogether, you may also want to think about incentives for private data provision without monopolization. And in the paper, we have a little scheme where we say, hmm, okay, the Digital Markets Act says that in the new world, with sort of the early intervention via the DMA um, provisions, that data should be released to anybody who is on a platform so that the gatekeeper alone may not maintain the data. We go a little bit further and say, okay, why not even go beyond that circle of platform members in releasing the data? And if that cuts too much into the incentives for private data collection and provision, let us think about a scheme. Maybe the most recent, the freshest data can remain private in order to maintain the incentives, but everything that is older than seven days should be released into the relation uh, comments. So let me uh, conclude because my time uh, is uh, close to up. Let's get back to the study at hand uh, because today we are studying something that I think is truly remarkable, and I want to applaud the authors for doing this, I want to applaud uh, anybody who has contributed to uh, executing it, to financing it, and, and so forth. Um, and, and I applaud the European Union for, again, making an attempt to put open source much more into the focus of innovation policy making. So I think that this is a really impressive achievement by the team. I think it goes far beyond the usual academic contributions, even, of 
course, I'm fond of our paper, but our paper is 35 pages reasoning. And what we have here is more than 400 pages of really uh, great data that allows us to assess the contribution of OSS and OSH to our economies, to our societies. And I've highlighted a few points here, and they will become the focus of debate, I'm sure, uh, during, during the date. And uh, I'm uh, truly stunned by the, uh, the diligent effort that has gone into this study. I think it will be a very, very important cornerstone for further policy discussions on, uh, on open source. Uh, let me conclude by simply saying openness has in the form of open source software, in the form of open source hardware, but certainly also in the form of opened and opening data, great benefits for growth and for digital autonomy. I cannot go into the last point. Uh, I'm doing that in a different paper, but I think that we urgently need to take our eyes off the classical toolbox that we have for fostering innovation that type of innovation will still need the intervention great that we have it but we need to take our eyes off it now and look at that other guidepost which is open source thank you very much for your attention